Hello and welcome to IDF's first virtual education event, COVID-19 and primary immunodeficiency. And thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Antela. I'm the Vice President of Education at the, Immune, at the Immune Deficiency Foundation and I will be your host for today's virtual event. So now I would like to welcome our CEO and President of IDF, John G. Boyle, to personally welcome you. Well, hello there, and I am now unmuted. How fabulous the technology is working as it should. Uh, well, on behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us as we pivot from what was originally supposed to be an in-person education meeting in Maryland uh, over to this, uh, the first of a whole new type of IDF education event. Uh, of course, one of the upsides to this uh, new virtual format is that there is absolutely no judgment if you decide to come to this event in your pajamas. Any other IDF event, you might get a little bit of side eye. Um, I appreciate everyone allowing us to uh, uh, test out the technology. Uh, many uh, of us here have become very uh, uh, familiar with Zoom over the last few weeks, uh, but boy, it's, it's nice to see that uh, that this works as it should when it's supposed to. Um, well, speaking of getting familiar with Zoom and other uh, remote uh, learning and uh, communication uh, platforms, um, you know, a month ago, uh, I was imagining that I was going to be doing this introduction in person, but uh, as you all know all too well, um, the world has changed a lot in the last few weeks. Um, now, despite the new challenges that all of us here have been facing, uh, the team at IDF uh, has been diligently uh, working, uh, uh, you know, with every new uh, issue that comes up uh, to make sure that we make the changes that we need to, uh, to our existing programming, uh, you know, meetings like this and events uh, where uh, we have uh, had a, a track record of providing information where people have asked for it, uh, as well as to address new needs uh, that have come up and uh, address new questions. Uh, and so I just want to thank uh, the, uh, the team at IDF. They have uh, uh, risen to the occasion uh, marvelously, and I am so proud uh, to be working with them. So uh, for the team at IDF who has helped us to uh, get to where it is that we are today and who've helped us to test out uh, some new events over this last week, um, thank you for, uh, for, for working with me and making sure that uh, those that you see on the screen are, are being well cared for. Now, uh, this pivot, uh, and I keep on calling it a pivot, uh, to virtual events is not only important for where we are today in terms of social distancing and uh, everything else, uh, but we also think that it's going to be very critical for where uh, we can go in the future, since we believe that using this approach uh, will ultimately help us to uh, help more people within the uh, PI community. And so as this is a bit of a kickoff to, uh, again, this whole new uh, world of, uh, of virtual events, um, we are going to need your feedback, uh, both uh, uh, here and then with any future events, uh, to make sure that uh, it, you know, we are doing all that we can and to make sure that we're meeting you where we need to be meeting you. So uh, we are going to be sending you an evaluation um, uh, in the not too distant future, I believe tomorrow, uh, and responding to this evaluation will help us to fine tune uh, this uh, type of event and other uh, future events to make sure that we're giving you what it is that you want and what it is that you need. Uh, now, of course, today's program was born out of what you told us that you wanted and needed today. So uh, our event today will address some of the questions you submitted in advance, um, but also during the uh, time here today, uh, as Kathy, I believe, had mentioned there, uh, please do uh, use the chat feature to continue to submit questions um, if uh, the time allows and, and they are very different than some of uh, what it is that we've already gotten. Uh, the presenters will try to answer them. Uh, if we don't get to all of them, uh, just know that we will uh, be uh, notifying all participants when the questions that were submitted via uh, this event uh, and their answers will be uh, available on the IDF website. So, with that, I would like to switch this over and thank the sponsors of this event and uh, uh, who've enabled us to do this and to, uh, to make this pivot. Uh, and we are just so very grateful for all of them, including our core service leaders, CSL Bearing, Griffles, and Takeda, our core service sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, our national sustainer, Acredo, 
And then our national patrons, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Corum CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Kaba Fusion, and Coru Medical Systems. And please do stay with us after the end of the meeting to visit with uh, three of the sponsors today who have agreed to serve as testers for our virtual exhibit hall. So you can get a chance to talk with them, learn about them, and hopefully ask a few questions. Now, uh, in terms of our sponsors, not only are we grateful for them for their support, uh, but many of you have heard me say before that in order to be an effective advocate for yourself, someone you care for with PI um, or someone else in the community, uh, it is absolutely critical that you know about all the different products and services and resources uh, available to our community. Uh, the more that you know, the better. So the more that you interact with our sponsors and the others who um, are providing uh, information and resources, uh, you know, it's really time well spent. So um, once this meeting is over, the learning and the fun uh, don't have to stop. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure that you know how to connect with IDF on social media to keep up to date. Uh, there's so much going on uh, that the more channels that we have to communicate with each other, uh, the better. So I think with all that said, uh, it's time for me to uh, wrap things up. And for that, I would like to thank you. I thanked our staff. Uh, uh, we will thank our uh, wonderful presenters. Uh, but I just want to thank all of you who've taken a little bit of time out of your um, uh, day here uh, to be a part of our community and to help us to pilot this very uh, new for us uh, and very exciting type of event. Um, we need to do this sort of piloting as the world around us continues to change. And your participation here today will help us to better serve you and of course others um, uh, within the PI community as we adjust to this, our new normal. So thank you all for being here. And with that, I would like to hand this back to Kathy. So Kathy, take it away, it's all yours. Thank you for that wonderful welcome, John. Before we begin our medical presentations, I do want to share a disclaimer. Um, IDF understands that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic is a rapidly evolving situation. So we do encourage you to check our website often for updates. And please remember too that the information presented during this event is not medical advice and is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Rather, we're here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information that, that can be used to help understand the current situation we are living in. So now I would like to hand the stage over to our first medical presenter, Dr. Alexandra Freeman. She is going to speak on COVID-19 basics. Dr. Freeman works at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in Bethesda, Maryland, and we are so grateful to have her here with us today. Please welcome Dr. Freeman. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm unmuted now, it seems like, um, and I realize you know, I've been doing certain weeks at the hospital and certain weeks at home teleworking. This is my week at the hospital, and I realize my office is a little bit messy, so I apologize for that, which I saw as soon as I uh, was on the video here. And uh, it's just been a little crazy going between the two places. Um, and um, also that the lighting in my office is a little bit weird. So anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19. Um, as the declaimer just said, you know, this is a rapidly changing field, and we're all trying to keep up with the knowledge as most of you are also trying to keep up with things in the news. But um, so I'll talk about some things that people, some people may already know, but also try to put this in context of primary immune deficiency and therapies as well. Okay, um, so what is COVID-19? Um, that is the name of the disease that we have been all talking about. It's actually caused by the novel virus that was named SARS-CoV-2 virus. SARS after the um, other severe coronavirus infection that was in Hong Kong a bunch of years ago, um, and then COVID for coronavirus, and then two, because it's the second one after the SARS one. This is a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses are viruses that we've all had. They usually cause just common colds and don't make people particularly sick. Um, but there have been some severe ones over the years. 
like the SARS one that was more in Asia. And then there was MERS several years ago, um, which was in the Middle Eastern countries. And usually we think these novel coronaviruses that have caused these um, outbreaks start from an animal. Um, it's unclear exactly what happened here and when this happened. You know, the initial thoughts were that this was from the open food market in Wuhan, um, part of China, and that it could have been spread by certain animals, such as a pangolin, which is featured here, in case anyone doesn't know what a pangolin looks like, or with snakes, and that this could be a virus that is carried by bats. Um, but really, we don't know exactly when this started, had this actually been around a little bit longer and which animal is the main vector for this infection. All we know is that it successfully made its way from its animal host to people and then has spread widely from person to person all over the world. So what are the symptoms of COVID-19? Um, you know, I think we have realized as time goes on that many, many people, probably the majority, are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. They've done some studies, and you know, we are gearing up to do our own here, actually, at NIH, where they've looked at kind of more widely at um, antibody levels to see exactly how many people really had this. And you know, for instance, in some of the um, towns in Italy or in China, they found you know really a lot more people than um, were initially suspected have actually had the infection without many symptoms at all. But what is concerning for all of us is that some people really get very, very sick and there has been a high mortality rate um, from this infection. I put a chart here from a New England Journal of Medicine paper that came out, um, you know, all of these papers obviously have come out this year in the last month or so, um, looking at um, the initial kind of outbreak in the Wuhan area of China um, these were more in the hospitalized patients and what symptoms do they have? And what was initially reported there, and we're finding in our country as well, is that fever and cough are by far the most common symptoms. So you can see in the chart I put here that about you know 89% of the patients, this is looking at a thousand patients or so, had fever, um, usually in the range of about 38 to 39. So that is about 100.5 to 102 fevers. Um, and then cough was ex also extremely common. About two thirds of the individuals had a cough and this was mostly described as a dry cough. And then the other symptoms that have been common are the shortness of breath and that, um, you know, people will notice, for instance, when they're walking, they may be okay in bed, but then they walk across the room and they notice that they're short of breath. Um, Headache, I think, is more common than we initially thought. In the, China, the study from China, they said 13%. But I think we're realizing that, um, that this is probably a little bit more common. And the fatigue is supposed to be extremely kind of debilitating fatigue. The other things that we've noticed more recently is um, in China, they reported about 4% of the individuals had diarrhea. I think that's probably been seen a little bit more commonly. Um, in our country and some of the European countries um, with some nausea and some diarrhea, that can be the initial description. The other symptom that has really come into the forefront more recently in some of the reports is this loss of smell or taste. And there's actually some papers now about that, which can even precede the symptoms. But people notice you know, this kind of odd like, oh my gosh, now I can't smell anything. Um, that, and really can go on for a couple of weeks. So I think one of the questions that worry all of us is, you know, who or we want to know is who is getting the more severe disease. So from the reports pretty much from every country is, you know, although a lot of people can get sick um, from this, those at an older age, um, especially those, you know, over 80 and then those over 60, um, have had many more, uh, much higher rates of hospitalization and higher rates of death. The studies coming out of China and more recently coming out of some of the other heavily hit countries have also highlighted other conditions. Um, and most of these are surrounded by, you know, some of the diseases that we see as people get older. Hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, kind of that metabolic syndrome we think about when you combine all those together, chronic lung disease with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney or liver disease, smoking, um, and obesity. Um, so, you know, the other thing is, and I realize I didn't put this up, it seemed that there's been a higher mortality rate in some of the reports in men. And we weren't sure at first, is this because of, 
you know, men having a higher incidence as they age of some of the heart disease and other symptoms or, you know, being more smokers, especially in China and men. But, you know, I think that is being seen in other reports as well. Um, but, you know, what's, what's really scary is that, you know, sometimes otherwise healthy people, even in their 20s and 30s and 40s, are sometimes getting severe disease and ending up in the hospital and sometimes even needing to be on a ventilator. And there's even been some cases of mortality. I didn't put this up there, but you know, one of the other higher risks where we've seen a lot of individuals is healthcare workers um, who are being exposed and sometimes have not had, um, you know, either early in the epidemic, you know, didn't realize about the need for um, such extensive um, protective equipment or have not had as, as much access to it. Um, the disease in kids compared to influenza, for instance, where you know kids get the flu and really get quite sick, um, the disease in kids seem to be much more mild or asymptomatic. Um, and I've been talking to, you know, my training is in pediatric infectious diseases, and I've been talking to my friends around the country um, at the big pediatric hospitals, and really it seems like the pediatric hospitals are seeing some cases, but are being more spared from the very severe cases that it's just a few compared to the adult hospitals you know, where they are really quite overwhelmed. In fact, some of the pediatric hospitals are now allowing some of the adults or turning one of their intensive care units into adult intensive care units. Um, but kids can still carry the virus and can transmit it to others, which was one of the big reasons you know, the schools immediately closed as these outbreaks um, started to become more apparent. Um, but you know what's been unclear and kind of all the reports coming out is you know how much worse outcomes are we seeing with underlying immune deficiency or even secondary you know primary or secondary or with more mild asthma for instance um, you know there was not much of a signal in China that children with asthma were having more trouble compared to children with asthma with influenza when they can get really quite sick now the incubation period once people have been exposed to someone with this, um, we know from the studies with very good contact tracing in China that it can take, you know, an average is about five days. So, and then most people are infected within 11 and a half days. And that is why we've come up with this incubation period of two to 14 days. So when people have to be on home quarantine after an exposure, we say 14 days because almost every single person has a symptom within 12 days. And then we just add two days to that to be a little bit extra careful and extra neurotic, which is really important through this period of time. But most people are getting sick within that first week. Um, but you know, if you know you've been exposed to someone, it is really essential to quarantine at home for 14 days to avoid spraying to others before symptomatic. And we do know from reports now that it is possible to spread this infection before you actually have symptoms, which is scary and why those of us at the hospital are walking around wearing masks all the time to try to avoid giving it to our patients, for instance, um, while we don't have symptoms. And um, partly because of that longer incubation period, and then because of the very severe cases that um, we are seeing at different hospitals, you know, as we've all become, you know, very accustomed to hearing about how essential it is to flatten our curve. So, um, and the need for social distancing. On the top, on the kind of the slide on the left there with the curve, this is a slide in various type of um, ways has been portrayed all over the news and Facebook and everywhere um, about, you know, what is the capacity of our healthcare system? And then if we just let this spread and be, you know, hope that, you know, eventually we'll all get immune and we will take the hit with some severe cases, our healthcare system really doesn't have the number of intensive care unit beds and the number of ventilators to really keep up with this disease. So what our goal has been is to keep people isolated and make the number of new cases not, you know, much, much more decreased so that our healthcare system not only has the available beds and the available ventilators and other needs and, you know, honestly, all the medicines that are needed for someone in the intensive care unit, but also gives us a time to you know, work on effective therapies, work on vaccine, which will take you know, obviously over a year. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight in some of the news reports in areas where they've looked to see how well social distancing is um, actually 
you know, undergoing, you know, are we doing a job, at, a good job at our social distancing that the lighter the, the lighter the state is, the better we're doing. And here is Maryland in a nice light color. And I've noticed that from that, I heard that from Montgomery County where I am. That's been very good too. So I'm very proud of all of us here in Maryland and we need to keep up the work um, of this. I know I've been looking at our own county where, you know, our doubling rate is about five to six days, but I'm really hoping that we really flatten our curve soon and see our doubling rate, you know, not existent anymore and that our number of new cases starts going way down. But, you know, we know it's still, um, there will be some bad weeks ahead for all of us. So what, do we, what are we supposed to do if we think we have this infection? First of all, and I didn't put this on my slide, I should have, the most important thing is really avoid being around people. You know, like that is not the time to go out, you know, wandering around or go to the grocery store, or go to the pharmacy, get people to help you with any of those needs at that point and keep yourself in quarantine and not exposed to others. And then call your doctor for advice. Um, you know, testing is really essential and it's the only way we'll really know how common this is and how this is being spread. And it's been difficult, right? It's been a problem that testing hasn't been more available, but it's becoming much more available. And there's a lot of drive-through spots there now. And you can see in the picture, here is someone going through a drive-through spot where someone is well-equipped in their, their protective equipment. And then that person doesn't get out of the car. They get the nose swab, which is you know one of these kind of uncomfortable swabs that goes all the way to the back of your nose. Um, but it can be done safely through these drive-through testing spots. Um, most just general doctor's offices and pediatric offices are not going to have the testing as easily available as some of these drive-through spots or the um, testing that's available in hospitals. The other thing is that I was hearing from a bunch of my patients getting tested that initially, you know, they weren't getting their results back for, you know, a week or so. Uh, most of the tests can be done in a day, but I think things were getting so backlogged. Um, the testing that we have available at NIH takes several hours and we do it once a day. Um, so we always get our results back in 24 hours. But you know, I think the availability of different tests is really varying from spot to spot. There are some hospitals now that do have tests that can be done within an hour. The thing though that we always worry about is how good is our test? If it's positive, we really think it's positive. It is there. You know, these are very, very sensitive tests in terms of, I mean, you know, very, very specific tests in that we know that if it's there, it's there. If it's negative though, it's not 100%. And there have been people where it might be negative initially and then it becomes positive as, you know, there's more symptoms or later in the course, maybe it won't be as positive. Um, so, you know, sometimes people have needed repeat testing. At our hospital, if someone's gonna have a procedure or if we're taking someone we were worried about, you know, could it be possibly COVID-19, um, we are actually doing two tests before we take them off isolation um, or before they have a procedure. Now, everyone wants to have an antibody test to see if they actually had this, and they were one of the lucky people that were asymptomatic. Um, you know, I think these tests, we're still working out like how good they really are, because they're lately not as specific. Antibody tests in general for viruses are not quite as good. They can cross-react with other viruses. Um, so, you know, it's still being sorted out just how perfect this is. Um, and then for um, some of the individuals with primary immune deficiency, the antibody test won't work because not everyone, you know, is able to mount a good antibody response. For instance, people with um, CVID, for instance, don't have good, or XLA, they don't have good antibody responses, and this will not be a reliable test in that setting. Okay, so what treatments are available? Now, you know, even among all of us, you know, in the healthcare field, it's like there's a new hot medicine, you know, every week. So this is a really rapidly changing um, field. But um, there's a bunch of possibilities, and we really need some time, and we really need some good study to figure out what works best and what is actually safest while it's working best. Um, but you know, I think um, I've seen different kind of versions of this um, figure I put up here. I grabbed this one from a journal of heart and lung transplant. But you know, this is kind of an important point when thinking about treatments for this disease. Um, individuals that get COVID-19, the infection and kind of when you're sick from it usually lasts a couple of weeks. And you know, first there's a period of time, right, where you're asymptomatic and that's the incubation phase where the virus starts to replicate. Um, but then um, after that is, you know, there is a period of about a week where there's often kind of the flu-y symptoms 
when you have fever and you have cough and you might have diarrhea and headache. And that's when you're really seeing kind of the symptoms related to the virus kind of replicating um, and your body's immune response, you know, beginning to kick in to control this virus. What's concerning about this disease isn't so much that first phase because most people seem to be doing reasonably okay, although totally miserable, you know, during that first phase. It's the second phase of the illness where suddenly we see much worse, you know, only for some individuals, but worse shortness of breath. And um, that's where individuals tend to end up on ventilators. And the thinking is, you know, changing to thinking that a lot of this might be related to the host inflammatory response, um, where you see kind of this intense inflammation related, you know, that's going after the virus. And so you see this really intense inflammatory response and then you're thinking about how to treat that has to change a little bit. In that period of time, also individuals are seeing a lot of kind of clots forming with, you know, like clots in the lungs also leading to more and more breathing issues. So in terms of therapies, you know, we got to think a little bit about what is better to kind of affect, you know, how much of the virus is there and then kind of later in the disease, people are more focused on actually changing kind of the inflammation response. Um, so, you know, all of these therapies are unproven. We really want people to do these things as part of studies. You know, medicines have side effects and we've had plenty of treatments that people have used where there can be side effects and the medicine eventually turns out not to work. And there's lots of examples already in this disease of therapies that were used that didn't work. So um, I just put up a couple here that have been mentioned. So in terms of blo blocking the viral replication, um, so you know the azithromycin, the hydroxychloroquine, that is a little bit both for the virus as well as the inflammatory response. Azithromycin has some kind of a little bit magical anti-inflammation responses, and we actually use azithromycin a lot in our primary immune deficiency patients. But the hydroxychloroquine seems to help with viral replication. Now we have no idea if that works in people, and the studies that have been done so far have been um, not well-controlled studies, you know, very small studies, so we really just don't know. The only thing I would caution about this regimen is that both of these medicines can cause EKG changes, um, can cause uh, some changes and in prolonged intervals in the heart. So um, there is some toxicity if that's used, and it's something you know that is much better done if you can be properly monitored. Um, hydroxychloroquine can also cause eye toxicity. Um, chloroquine, which is also similar to hydroxychloroquine, can also cause some um, funny kind of dreams and um, kind of, uh, you know, can cause, you know, sometimes it's caused some psychological changes. The other thing is that, you know, hydroxychloroquine is a medicine that people used um, often for lupus. Um, and, you know, these medicines are being used a lot now and people that really need these medicines are having some trouble um, acquiring the medicines for the uh, lupus and other symptoms. So that is one though that's getting a lot of attention and maybe it will turn out to be helpful. There are some ongoing studies now looking at that more closely. Remdesivir is an antiviral that um, was initially developed for Ebola. Again, it didn't work, you know, after it was properly studied for that. But, you know, it looks like it could have some activity for um, both for SARS, you know, several years ago, but now for um, SARS-CoV-2 um, in terms of blocking replication. There's actually an ongoing study here at the NIH that is placebo controlled to use remdesivir to see if it is effective. And then another thing that maybe can help some with the viral period is using immune serum. So, you know, people in the primary immune deficiency, many people know about that. That's, you know, using things like immune globulins, using other people's antibodies to see if it can block infections. Now, in general, you know, immune globulin is better for certain bacterial infections than most viral infections. And, um, you know, we don't think of the antibody response as being quite as good for things like, you know, getting a regular coronavirus cold. But um, it does seem to have helped Hopefully some people, like there is some kind of anecdotal um, experience now that um, using that serum might be able to help um, those um, recover more quickly from COVID-19. Now it's 
interesting, all these other therapies that are being used um, to block inflammation. And these have been used mostly in the setting of people really sick in the hospital, and they're either about to go on a ventilator or they just went on a ventilator, and they have these very kind of you know, widespread lung disease and people are getting kind of desperate. Now in that setting, um, you know, we'll often use in other types of um, um, underlying disease processes, you know, if there's bad, um, you know, like diffuse lung disease, we'll use steroids. So steroids have been used some, so prednisone or the IV versions of prednisone have been used some in this disease as well with kind of mixed results. You know, we worry a little bit because, you know, if you suppress the immune system with something like steroids, then the virus could actually replicate more. So it's kind of getting that fine balance, making sure the virus is under control, and then um, seeing whether or not you can actually um, attack the inflammation response. Um, one that's been interesting for me hearing about that's been used a fair amount is tocilizumab. That is um, a monoclonal antibody that blocks um, one of the inflammatory molecules, cytokines called IL-6. Um, that um, is used for certain rheumatologic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis um, and has been used some in um, certain immune dysregulation syndromes. So, um, you know, that is one that people are using kind of right as it seems like the inflammation response um, starts increasing. You know, I um, follow kind of one of the largest cohorts of patients that I follow um, are those with hyper IgE syndromes where IL-6 signaling is already somewhat impaired. So it's been interesting for me to hear about the use of that, wondering how, what that means for my patients, you know, who already have decreased IL-6 signaling, you know, could that be a good thing, you know, for this period of blocking inflammation? And Akinra, which blocks IL-1 signaling has been used some, um, and JAK inhibitors, um, which are involved, um, and also in kind of the inflammation part of the immune response. Now, again, with JAK inhibitors, which are used for um, some of our immune deficiencies, um, the most common one people think about it with is called gain-of-function STAT1, but, um, you know, JAK inhibitors can actually make viral infections worse. So, you know, again, it's thinking about the timing of this. Um, you know, do you want to you know, you want to make sure the virus is somewhat controlled before you then dampen the inflammatory response. So how is COVID-19 affecting people with primary immune deficiency? You know, we really just don't know now, you know, at this point. I mean, these diseases, the um, PIs are rare. And, um, you know, so in the disease, although it's affecting many, you know, you know, obviously hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people now, um, in our country, you know, it's still a small portion of the population. And then you have to think about the primary immune deficiency individuals. And I also think are the populations like those with primary immune deficiency that are at risk, you know, I'm sure um, just like I've been telling all my patients, you know, to make sure they are extremely self-isolating, you know, and not being around groups of people. That's probably true for um, many of you too, that you've really been avoiding exposures as much as possible to try to make that risk as minimal as possible. And that's what I keep telling my patients, even if, you know, when I wonder about the inflammation response, you know, we don't really want to find out, you know, we really don't want a lot of people to get this and we, you know, so... Um, not knowing as much is, you know, could also mean that we're doing a good job of not letting our patients get sick with this. But, you know, overall, so far, for the limited number of cases that we know about, it seems like, you know, as like, if you put them all in a basket, primary immune deficiency doesn't seem like as big a risk as, you know, some of the others, like the increased age and the cardiopulmonary disease. You know, but again, it's not clear at this point. Um, so, but obviously every primary immune deficiency is different, right? We can't lump everyone together. So when you think about T lymphocyte defects, like combined immune deficiency, the severe combined immune deficiency to George, you know, there, um, the T cells are what's really necessary initially to control the virus. So potentially, you know, that could be worse. And, um, we know, for instance, babies that have skid you know, do extremely poorly when they have respiratory viral infections. So we worry that it would be the same um, with this virus as well. For B lymphocyte defects, so um, like XLA or CBID, uh, oops, 
I made a typo there. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I meant to say without a T cell defect. So the B cell defects, you know, sometimes people can have CBID and have a little bit of a T cell issue in there as well. So, um, so in general, oh, if we think of just, you know, an antibody defect, we think of this as a little bit less of a concern for some of these, this type of viral infection. However, a lot of people that have these antibody defects have had recurrent pneumonias and can have bronchiectasis and lung disease, and this could then increase the risk. Um, you know, I've seen in some of my patients with bronchiectasis, you know, even from getting a simple cold, you know, they can end up with a very severe exacerbation. And I would think this could be very similar to that. We know there have been at least several patients now with um, CBID, and overall, it seems like the hospitalization rate or the um, severity seems like the general population as well. But, you know, again, it's way too early to know. And then there's neutrophil defects, um, for instance, chronic granulomatous disease, um, neutropenia. So neutrophils are less important to control viruses. But again, we worry when people have underlying lung disease that it's easier with a neutrophil problem to get a secondary bacterial infection. And the other thing is for chronic granulomatous disease, again, we don't know, but those individuals can have very intense inflammation responses. So we don't know if that would be a bigger problem for that kind of second phase of the illness. Um, but you know, we keep wondering if for that second phase when the inflammation response is very intense, could some sorts of primary immune deficiencies be a little bit protected? You know, we just don't know at this point, and we really, really want everyone to avoid infection as much as possible. So I keep, you know, doing that telling that to my patients um, and really trying to figure out any way to have them be at home through this period of time. Okay, so one of the questions that keeps coming up is, will this be seasonal? Can we relax soon? And of course, you know, I would love that. We just really don't know. And, you know, some of the studies are really kind of varying and the epidemiology will tell us, you know, some of the more recent reports were not as promising. We know that there have been a lot of cases in some of the countries right now that are hotter than we are now. And in Florida, for instance, they've had plenty of cases. I put a graph down here of, this is just looking at flu um, and actually influenza deaths. And you can see here that, you know, when you look at each year that it is seasonal, you know, the cases are way up in January and they come down by the time it's April. And it has a very, very clear pattern. And that's true for some of the other coronaviruses and other respiratory viruses as well. And um, for some of these viruses, including some coronaviruses, the spread seems to decrease with hot and humid weather, which is definitely our weather, you know, in the next couple months. But um, we don't really know how much of an impact this will be. Also, some of that decrease in those, those months is that people are more naturally socially distanced, right? Like we don't have kids in school in the summertime. You know, people, you know, are a little bit more outside and not kind of all huddled in together. So we just need to see. Um, but then our concern is if it does decrease, it could come up again in the fall. And we all think even when we get through this initial horrible phase, there will be kind of more blips along the way. Okay, that was my last slide. <laughs> so thank you and I'll be answering questions later, but I think um, the next speaker, Dr. Keller will be next. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Wonderful presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Michael Keller, who will speak on COVID-19 and the PI community. Dr. Keller is a physician at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. Please welcome Dr. Keller. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, thank you, and, and thank you very much to Dr. Freeman uh, for uh, that information. So mine's gonna be a slightly lighter kind of uh, topic that uh, I was asked to talk about. Uh, mainly kind of preventative measures and, um, and just coping with, uh, with the current um, um, uh, isolation and social distancing that we're having to all uh, do. So first, uh, this is a little bit of rehash from Dr. Freeman. Uh, actually, so like Dr. Freeman mentioned, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, is primarily a respiratory virus. So the primary method of, of spread is through coughing, sneezing, and then perhaps potentially also uh, through, uh, through direct contact. So in other words, if someone coughs on their hand or sneezes on their hand and then, and then, uh, and then shakes hands. Uh, the virus has been isolated in some, some studies out of China in, uh, in the stool and in tears, 
um, but there's been no documented foodborne transmission to date. So likely that's, that's probably not, not a, a major concern. A uh, nice study uh, out, of, uh, out of NIAD uh, was uh, published in New England Journal just uh, last month, which just demonstrated uh, the stability of this virus in the environment. So this is a uh, is RNA virus, and it's the same type as a lot of other cold viruses, a coronavirus, but um, it uh, unfortunately can be stable in the environment for several days, and uh, where it lands tends to act actually seems to matter. So the, this study tested uh, the, the stability of the virus on different, different materials, and they found that it was most stable in, on either plastic or on stainless steel, on which uh, they could det detect a still infectious virus for up to three days. So less, uh, less detectable um, for, for a longer period uh, on cardboard, and a few, uh, few studies have been able to actually identify infectious virus on clothing. Uh, however, there was a study recently that, that uh, sampled the virus in various places in a healthcare facility, and they were, uh, unfortunately, this was again in healthcare workers who were taking care of COVID-19 patients, they weren't able to identify uh, virus on the outside of the masks. So, like Dr. Freeman mentioned, this is a uh, virus that's what's called an envelope virus, which means it actually has parts of the cells that it actually grows in uh, that, are, that are, make up part of the virus. Because of that, actually, it's susceptible to a lot of, of uh, cleaning agents. So you essentially can break that membrane, and if that membrane is broken, that makes up the virus, it's no longer inf infectious. So in that way, uh, just a lot of common disinfectants can be used that will kill it. Um, heat and UV seemingly may kill it, uh, at least uh, on certain surfaces. Uh, it seems to be very stable, however, on cold. So at four degrees, it was stable potentially uh, for, for many days. Uh, it's also, however, inactivated by many strong acids and bases. So a lot of common cleaning materials are able to kill it. Obviously, our first line of defense is proper hand washing. And, and I'll stress, even and soap and water is able to inactivate most uh, um, envelope viruses. The important part is actually making sure that we're washing our hands properly. Uh, so in order to be washing your hands, uh, you have to make sure you're actually, uh, you lather properly, that you're washing for a minimum of 20 seconds and you're covering all surfaces. So really learning how to do this right is really essential right now. There's a lot of uh, great websites that will actually add in lyrics for your 20 seconds so that you're, you make sure you're actually doing the proper length. Uh, but as you see in these, these, um, in these uh, slides, making sure you get uh, the front and back of your hands, going between your, hand, uh, your fingers and the webbing, making sure that you're actually uh, consciously uh, uh, cleaning your nails, and then you go over your thumbs to make sure that you've, you've covered all, all areas. So another, the common question we get is really what disinfectant should work? And obviously a lot of them right now are, are, are not easily gotten. Um, but uh, the important, uh, important uh, things here are to make sure that you're actually cleaning high touch areas. So this includes areas that, that where you commonly are placing your hands like tables, doorknobs, keyboards, toilets, faucets, and it really stress phones. People really uh, don't, don't, don't forget to, uh, to clean their phone adequately. Um, and then using a, a cleaner that, that you know will is actually proven to kill this virus. So any cleaners that are either, that have an adequate percentage of, al of alcohol, so greater than 70% ethanol or isopropanol, uh, cleaners that are bleach-based or quaternary ammonium-based, and the CDC has a very extensive list of, of possible ones. So um, obviously Clorox, Lysol, Cavicide, all the common ones that, that, uh, that we use that, that, are, that are well documented to be antiviral. Uh, in absence of those, obviously because so many of these are very hard to find right now, uh, deleted household bleach actually is quite effective. And um, so by deleted, you actually, deleted mean a third, one third cup of bleach in a gallon of water. So actually if you have concentrated bleach at home, that can actually can go a long way. Uh, obviously you have to be very careful because that will destroy clothes. <laughs> Um, but um, very effective though on, uh, on uh, high touch areas and you could basically kind of, um, you could basically clean with that, let it, uh, let it be for a little bit and then go over it again with soap and water to make sure that you're not, you know, uh, you're not going to basically destroy anything with uh, the bleach usage. So I want to talk a little bit more now about social distancing and the, the, obviously the, the math behind it is essentially that um, 
each virus has a what's called a reproductive number, or uh, in the, uh, you often heard of it, hear it uh, referred to as an R naught, and it, it differs by different uh, for viruses. So influenza is R naught. It's usually it's somewhere around about two, and uh, as best we can tell, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has an R naught that's close, somewhere closer be between two and a half to four. And so what, what that means basically is that it's the number of, of people that an infected person will spread the virus to. So here, this, this diagram shows uh, the um, spread of virus with an R naught of 2.5. So if, it, if in five days, basically it doubles to 2.5 people for one person, then in 30 days, 400 people will be infected if there's no, uh, no change in, in, um, in how people are isolated. However, if there's 50% less exposure, so if 50% of the people uh, who have the infec infection are quarantined, then, uh, then you've, you've reduced that to only 1.25 people infected in five days. So obviously that ends up in 30 days being far, far less people infected. Uh, if we increase the 75%, then potentially we can actually, uh, um, we can reduce this to, uh, to single, uh, single numbers. So obviously that's 100% um, isolation is impossible because we have essential workers. So we have, uh, we have logistics and, and uh, supplies that have to go on. So obviously it's, it's um, as much isolation as it's gonna be feasible. Uh, so what exactly do we mean by social distancing? I'm sure many of you have seen this many, many times, but it's, uh, we're defining it as maintaining an adequate space uh, so that basically that, that there's no chance that someone who's coughing or sneezing will actually um, transmit uh, respiratory droplets to another person. Uh, avoiding credit areas are really important uh, to us. Really, the only places right now that are that are of major concern obviously would be uh, supermarkets or pharmacies. So minimizing the number of times going out, trying to call it off hours, anything that you can do to basically minimize the amount of exposure to a large number of people. And then uh, masks have been, um, I mean, initially were, were not recommended simply because um, they were obviously needed in healthcare facilities and uh, it was unclear really if they were doing much. Uh, now the, the thinking now is that um, it, it, you know, even though uh, simple masks like, like, uh, like cloth masks or surgical masks may not be perfect protection for you, but if everyone's masked, then you're gonna reduce the number of people who are spreading this since again, it's primarily respiratory spread. And thereby, we should be able to, um, to further decrease the spread if everyone is masked. Obviously, social distancing presents a lot of uh, complications to life. And, and in order to, to, uh, to really be able to, to, uh, uh, to cope with uh, the um, isolation and, uh, and, and the changes to our, how, we, how we all live, um, it's obviously a lot of, a lot of things that are recommended that are helpful. Obviously trying to get exercise as much as you can. This is uh, obviously a lot easier for folks who are in the, su in the suburbs or rural areas than it is in, in the city. But uh, ways you can do indoor exercise, such as yoga, tai chi, doing floor exercises or interval training. There's a lot of wonderful um, new um, programs, many of which are actually free now, uh, in order to, uh, to do um, inter essentially interactive or recorded uh, exercise. Um, that are either on the internet or on TV. Uh, meditation is really wonderful for uh, for being able to um, to de-stress. Uh, reading, audiobooks, um, podcasts, any 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 ways basically to uh, to spend time and hopefully not be on CNN too much. So Italy obviously did a, a wonderful job with kind of uh, with pioneering uh, social distancing, as shown here. Um, but really, it's a renaissance when it can, when it's when it comes to uh, uh, technologies for uh, for digital interaction. So I really encourage people to take advantage of that and uh, to make sure that you're reaching out to people. Uh, probably many people over the last uh, uh, week, in terms of the holidays, have probably been uh, doing essentially only interacting with family in that way. Um, but uh, but it's it's far far better than nothing. So I encourage people to to keep uh, keep interacting with each other. And uh, importantly, uh, the news, uh, you know, the, it, it's preferentially bad. Uh, and uh, although I, I will say that there's, a, there's still a lot of good, uh, good that's happening in the world, uh, in the research realm, uh, there's, I mean, uh, internationally, uh, nearly, uh, I mean, nearly every group I'm aware of is working on this. So there's, and, and there's a, a lot of wonderful stories about uh, people who are 
rising to the occasion. So I would say, uh, especially before, uh, before you go to bed, turn the news off. <laughs> Uh, there's also other other ways that, that I, I still think uh, should be really uh, uh, safe, and these are really uh, things, for instance, in Maryland that Larry Hogan did not uh, prohibit with the uh, lockdown. That includes outdoor activity, running, biking, hiking. Uh, really, if, as long as you're in a in an area that's not crowded, this really should be fine. Because again, if with good ventilation, this is not this is not a virus really that should be uh, traveling long distances. Um, so yard work and gardening all should be fine. Um, if you go far, though, I mean, for, if you have to for any reason, I would recommend a mask. And again, I would strongly advise uh, keeping away from public areas. Uh, with that, um, I believe that's it for my slides. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Keller. That was wonderful. We appreciate you sharing the information with our community. Um, before we continue to our Q&A portion, I would like to encourage participants to continue using the chat box to send any questions that they may have. And if time allows today, the presenters will answer them. If not, the questions will be submitted during this event will be available on our website and answered there or available as part of a future event. So while you're submitting your questions, I would like to invite our sponsors of today's virtual event to say a few words while we give our presenters some time to get ready to answer questions. First, Sorry. I would like to introduce Sean McCabe from Takeda. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, I saw the name up there, so didn't know if I should start. Um, so Sean McCabe, I have the honor and the privilege of leading our marketing efforts for the PI patient community. Um, so needless to say, sorry, my monitor's up here, my camera's down here. So if I'm looking like I'm off in space, uh, one of the unique challenges of the virtual environment. But so needless to say, um, you know, it, I don't think it needs to be said, but certainly wish we could be engaging under uh, different circumstances, not only as a, as a community, but certainly as a country. Um, but uh, certainly really proud of the efforts everyone uh, has been making to try and, um, you know, deal with the, with the kind of current reality that we're in. And so I want to, I, I do want to extend a special thanks, John, and to you and your team from an IDF perspective, um, recognizing that now more than ever, community is so very important um, and obviously a, a need for a source of truth and understanding. So uh, a sincere thanks for not only uh, uh, taking kind of the leap and the risk of, of doing this, uh, uh, not only in the virtual way, but just the ongoing efforts to, to spread information to those who need it. So uh, a sincere thanks and our participation's uh, greatly valued. Um, and then a, a quick note, just an aside, uh, obviously to Alexander and Michael and to the broader HCP community in some respects, um, you guys are all true heroes. And uh, we've always felt that certainly within the industry, for people who've dedicated their lives and, and uh, much of their, their passion to helping those in need, uh, so now more than ever, I think that recognition's there. Uh, but uh, a sincere thanks, obviously, from all of us and just to the broader community and those who are helping support uh, and care take for those in need. And so just a, a few couple of, I know it's a, it's a short couple minutes here for Takeda, uh, but I just want to say how proud I am of, uh, of the response we've had as an organization. Um, really, really happy to see from uh, a broader direction from a company standpoint, uh, a true reflection and, and uh, underscoring of uh, the commitment that we've got, not only to the safety of the community and, and, uh, and our employees, but also just um, a broader focus on trying to be a part of the solution. And so really proud to see right out of the gates, um, very much on the leading edge as an employer of having us all work from home before many uh, uh, within the industry in some respects took, uh, took that leap. Uh, and they knew that in the sense that we needed to maintain that uh, that support and innovation to the community uh, more than ever. And so uh, while we ceased a lot of our touch points within the community, whether it was HCPs or the patients, it doesn't mean we've stopped doing what we're doing. Um, so we are very, very focused now, not only in trying to offer new or, or generate awareness of solutions within the community uh, and, and supporting those who are uh, potentially moving into different sites of care, offering financial assistance given the, uh, the economic uh, uh, kind of dynamic out there, but just also uh, 
building a foundation uh, for the future on things like this. Um, even in the best of times, we recognize the need to engage will be a, a blend between live and virtual in some respects. So we're, we're, we're preparing for a future of that for sure. And then uh, more importantly, just the other sponsors that were on that initial slide, uh, and this is public, but really proud of the innovative partnerships we've had across the industry, and particularly uh, CSL and Takeda uh, ourselves re recently partnered up to, to create more scale and, uh, and potential uh, offerings of a solution around a hyperimmune unbranded. So really, really proud of just the broader efforts as a, as a company, but also as an industry on how we're, how we're help, trying to help out this uh, humanitarian crisis in our own respects. Uh, so that being said, you know, it, it's not just my voice. Uh, I wanted you to hear very briefly, I was gonna introduce Dana Flathammer. While I'm proud of what we're doing as a company, I'm even more proud of what her and her team are doing to help the PI community. Uh, Dana leads our PI community support team, and uh, just here to offer just a couple words, and uh, then we'll pass it along. Thanks, Sean. Um, just a word of thanks to everybody for joining today. I know myself, I have four kids with primary immunodeficiency, and you may know that our my IG source team is all patients and caregivers. So everybody on our team is either a patient living with primary immunodeficiency or they're a caregiver. So we have a spouse, we have parents, and really we, like Sean said, understand that community matters so much at all times, but now more than ever. We've extended our hours. Um, we are really focusing in on finding a new normal, mm -hmm. looking at ways in which we can navigate these challenges together. I, I'm shocked that none of my children have walked in as I'm trying to present, like many of you, I'm trying to run, do a dual role. And so we take our responsibility to the PI community really, really seriously. And we're here and we're here to listen and we don't always have the answers, but we are walking the same walk as you. And we hope that we can be of service to our community. Sean, thanks for letting me have a voice. Kathy, I think back to you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I would like to introduce Lori Giampaolo from CSLB. Thank you, Kathy, and, and thank you um, everyone for, for having me today. And, you know, I was thinking about um, this virtual meeting that we were having today and thinking that um, so many of you I would see at our live meetings. Um, I um, was in sales, I'm now in marketing, and I, I used to be at the Philly events and the Harrisburg events and the Hershey events. So it's really nice that we can take that platform um, with a lot of um, the same um, people and 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 bring it um, to Zoom. I think we're all getting to be Zoom experts here. Um, but thank you so much for having me. I think um, now more than ever, uh, we all need to be available um, to each other. And um, you know, Sean, I thought you um, so eloquently, you know, stated about you know the importance of um, you know what manufacturers um, can bring um, to this and about the partnership um, that that we have to really you know come up with a solution um, because we're all better together um, than than we are separately and that's really been i think the the joyful part of this um if you will um for me if you can find you know any joy in this but um the the only other pieces that i'll add and i look forward to speaking with everyone when we're in our breakout rooms is that um you know very similar to what you you've heard is that you know cso we we continue um to be committed to safeguarding um, uh, patients, um, employees, donors. Um, you know, our donor sites are are certainly open, um, so that we can continue making you know life saving therapies um, for patients, and um, you know we continue to 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 take measures you know to just support um, the health and well being of, of everyone that's involved. So um, I'll keep it short, but thank you again for for having me, and I'll look forward to the breakouts. Thank you, Lori. Now I would like to introduce Dakota Fisher Vance from Horizon. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so I am on the patient advocacy team at Horizon Therapeutics, and Horizon is focused on the rare rheumatic disease states. And I'm just really excited to be here, uh, you know, and really witness how incredibly resilient and willing to continue to show up for each other in these really challenging times the primary immune deficiency community is. As zebras, I'm sure you're not unfamiliar with having to deal with a medical emergency or stay home and miss out on events. 
uh, but that doesn't mean that those feelings of isolation aren't challenging. Um, that being said, IDF has really shown me through events like this and really, you know, making things more virtual um, and they're just proactive, continued communication with the community that you're never really alone when you're part of the primary immune deficiency community. Uh, so thank you to IDF for making this happen. Thank you to all of the amazing presenters uh, for taking a break in what is no doubt a really chaotic time in your lives to provide really much needed education. And thank you to all of you for continuing to show up for each other. You inspire us to keep showing up for the community too. So thank you and I look forward to seeing you in the breakout session. Thank you, Dakota. And again, thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors. You're amazing. Um, remember everybody that we will have the opportunity to learn more from our sponsors later during the program. So at this time, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Keller will be answering questions related to COVID-19 in the PI community. Each of our presenters will take turns answering questions and you will see the questions on the screen. So for our first question, um, I will read the question to our presenters and and I'll moderate as, as needed. Um, Dr. Freeman, this first question is for you. Is there a way to determine if you've had COVID-19 and recovered or if you have it but are asymptomatic? Okay, so um, this question really gets at the, um, some of that antibody testing that I was discussing. So the only way to really prove right now if you have it is if you have a positive test, one of the um, PCR nose swab tests, um, where you can definitely see the infection was there and, um, and then afterwards, maybe you would see a positive antibody. Um, but you know, not everyone is able to get those tests or sometimes it's done when it's negative and you're like wondering, you know, was that a false negative and uh, um, the test was done too late. So we're all hoping that we'll have a better antibody test that will really be quite reliable to know whether or not you've had it and have recovered um, adequately. So, um, but again, as I said before, um, this test would not be quite as good or will not be any good really if um, someone has an antibody defect. But uh, these tests are beginning to come out now and we will just have to see how good they are. Dr. Freeman, the next question is also for you. Can you get the virus twice? This is a very hot topic that we don't really know the answer to. Um, there were some possible cases in Asia where you know, it seemed like someone got better and then they had a positive test again. Now, in part, once you have, you know, the virus, the, um, even if the virus isn't spreading anymore and you're not contagious, you can still see some evidence of its RNA still in the nose or wherever you're looking for it. So it's, positive, it's possible to have a test that might be positive for a while after you're actually sick from it. So, um, and the symptoms from this can really fluctuate. People often say they feel sick for a few days and then better for a few days and then they get sicker again. So um, we don't really know of people that were sick, fully, fully better, and then clearly got this again. Um, we think it's unlikely that you can get it twice, but it's still kind of out there for debate right now. Thank you. Dr. Keller, can the virus cause permanent damage to my body or make my PI worse? Yeah, this is a great question. So the, the main target for this virus seems to be the lungs. Uh, it's very, it's very, very highly tropic to res respiratory cells. So the big concern, even for normal individuals, is uh, is really uh, is having uh, having their lungs recover after they have this. Uh, obviously, anyone who has underlying uh, lung damage, um, uh, either due to an intrinsic lung problem or due to PI, there's a worry that that you might be more prone to, to having uh, having kind of a wor worsening of that if you get this virus, but. That said, uh, we don't really don't know enough about about what people look like at, who are recovering from this. Whether they could potentially have more scarring after the after this virus or not. Um, we'll really know more, unfortunately, in the coming months as uh, as we kind of as more more robust studies are done. Um, so, really, the best best thing we can say is uh, right now it's it's possible, but we don't know entirely. Dr. Freeman, I don't run a fever when I get sick. Will I be able to receive the test if I think I get, if I'm, if I, if I'm sick? Excuse me. 
So I think, you know, this was really hard at first. Like you had to have like everything, you know, in order to get tested. I think um, the tests have become more common and the testing is much more lenient now. I know at NIH, you know, we do like people to have two symptoms, right? Like you can walk outside right now and cough because there's so much storm pollen in the air. But if you have cough and a little shortness of breath or cough and a fever or cough and a, you know, some diarrhea, then um, it's pretty easy to get a test here. Um, I realize NIH is an easier place as an employee to get a test though than elsewhere. Um, but I do think the criteria loosening up and your physician should understand that in the world of primary immune deficiency, the symptoms are not classic. And I think if that's explained, it should be able to get tested. Thank you. Dr. Keller, does IG therapy protect me from COVID-19? Yeah, it's another good question. Uh, so, and again, uh, unfortunately, uh, early on, actually, I re reached out to a lot of makers of immunoglobulin to see if there were any uh, reports yet or studies about cross-reactivity, and unfortunately, there was very little known. Uh, I, like Dr. Freeman earlier mentioned, uh, a lot of, as, as uh, a lot of groups are developing antibody tests to try and understand who has immunity to, to COVID-19, there's a lot of early reports about, uh, about these tests cross-reacting with other coronaviruses. So whether that's just part of, part of the test not being good or whether that is truly biology, whether there's some cross-reactivity uh, with, with some circulating coronaviruses, we still don't know entirely yet. This is a very, this coronavirus in particular is very different from the, the ones that usually circulate in the population, which are predominantly what are called alpha coronaviruses. So uh, unfortunately, I would operate on the assumption that your immunoglobulin does not give you protection against this. Maybe we'll find out later that it, that it gives you some, but until we know more, I would say probably don't make that assumption. Again, Dr. Keller, is it safe to get my treatments at an infusion center or should I stop them until the pandemic is over? Yeah. So most infusion centers that, that deal with patients with, who are immunocompromised really should be savvy enough to be able to, to make all the, all the uh, required changes to keep you safe. And that would basically be making sure that you have adequate space, that they're screening people who come in the door to make sure they're not sick, and, really, uh, and that really uh, everyone is masked and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, having adequate uh, personal protective equipment. So uh, I would say really that uh, making sure that you get your immunoglobulin is really essential. And, if, and um, even, if, uh, even if your immunoglobulin really, even if it doesn't have direct uh, antibodies against this virus, um, anyone who gets this virus potentially might be at risk for secondary infections and making sure that you're, you're fully tanked up is a really important thing right now. So I would really, uh, I'd encourage everyone to make sure they do whatever they can to keep on their, on their necessary therapies. Um, if you're concerned about the safety of your infusion center, you absolutely can talk to your your uh, your your immunologist, your primary your your uh, your, doc, doc, your team about whether you can safely get it at home instead, uh, or uh, or for instance uh, consider subcutaneous therapy. Um, but uh, it, short of that, I think it's more important to make sure you're getting your therapy um, than to than to stay home entirely. I would say that's a pretty important visit to to try to prioritize. Dr. Freeman, what precautions should my home health nurse take when I'm getting my IG therapy at home? Um, that's a question I'm getting a lot from my patients recently. So um, what I'm telling them is to make sure that, you know, that people do wear masks, you know, when we can't be those magical kind of six feet and ideally even more and outside away from each other, it is more important that everyone wears a mask. So I'm telling my patients to wear a mask, you know, when the home health care nurse is there with them and that the nurse is wearing a mask and that they're wearing gloves and that people are just washing their hands nonstop. I mean, you just have to really think about, okay, you know, I just touched that piece of paper that the other person just touched. I should go wash my hands. You know, oh no, my nose is itching. Go wash your hands before you touch your nose. So to be really cognizant of all those different factors. And I have had, you know, I mean, a bunch of my patients have been doing this and uh, just making sure people come in and are safe. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, again, is it true that ibuprofen should not be taken if you are diagnosed with COVID-19? So this is one of those, again, kind of controversial questions out there right now. There was some, you know, again, some not great data, but some data to be like, oh, are people doing worse when they're on ibuprofen? Because ibuprofen 
you know, does have anti-inflammatory, that's what it is, it's an anti-inflammatory medication. And for that initial phase of the virus, could it be a little bit worse? You know, we don't have any good proof of this, um, and we just don't know. And actually, the World Health Organization that initially said that then retracted kind of these statements. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you do okay taking Tylenol, then that's fine. And, you know, I mean, Tylenol is a little bit safer, especially if you're dehydrated. Um, you know, with this, um, ibuprofen can be a little bit more risky to take. Um, what I've been telling people is, if you can, take acetaminophen or Tylenol, but don't be scared if you have to take ibuprofen every once in a while to really get your fever and your headache away so that you can hydrate yourself better um, and feel better. Dr. Keller, my family member has PI. Other than the typical precautions, are there additional precautions I should take? That's uh, a great question. Uh, so really, uh, I would, uh, my only suggestion here would be just to, uh, to consider uh, um, uh, consider basically uh, uh, plans basically in the case that uh, that uh, that someone were to if someone were to get sick how, how would you go about being able to kind of do isolation um, and then uh, be doing everything you can to really uh, be able to prevent that person from having to have exposure so if if someone uh, someone who um, who doesn't have PI can primarily do the shopping or whatnot um, but otherwise um, otherwise really it's the same precautions that just about everyone should be taking. Dr. Freeman, someone in my house works in a high-risk environment for being exposed to the virus. What kinds of precautions should we take so we don't become infected? Yeah, I, this has come up. I mean, I feel like, you know, a lot of my patients have a parent that works in the healthcare field or something, um, and it's really, really tricky, you know. If, um, you know, if you're a high-risk individual and you have a family member that has to work in the high-risk environment, you know, first of all, there's always the question of, you know, going to your boss and having a conversation to see if there's any way to minimize things. You know, for instance, um, you know, one of, my, one of my patients who has a lot of the risk factors, you know, trying to have our family members and nurse have the nurse work, but in a non-COVID unit, you know, like, any way they can mitigate the risk for the families, I think is helpful. Um, but otherwise, I think what a lot of people are doing um, who are in the healthcare fields is trying to decontaminate as much as possible when you go home. You know, for instance, taking off your shoes outside. You know, when I go home and I mean, we don't have a lot, but we do have cases of COVID in our hospital and just being around people like this week when I'm working here in the hospital, you know, as soon as I walk in the door, besides washing my hands, I immediately, you know, take a shower, try to ch change your clothes, you know, try to remove any of those risks as much as possible. Thank you. And this will be the last question, Dr. Keller. Is it safe to go outside for a walk or sit on my porch without wearing a mask? So, yeah. Uh, really, uh, so this should be fine. Uh, again, uh, being outside as long as as long as it's uh, as long as it's just you outside and uh, anyone in your immediate household and not having other people visit, uh, this should be totally fine. Um, I mean, we are saying uh, that uh, the masks are, are a good idea. Um, again, the, the, the intent there is primarily when, when you're doing things that are essential, like shopping for food or going to the pharmacy. Um, but uh, being, being outdoors with a high, high degree of ventilation, really, uh, you shouldn't need to wear a mask for that necessarily. Thank you. So thank you, of course, to our wonderful presenters for answering all these questions. We know how, how busy you are and during this time especially so it does it means so very much to us that you have generally volunteered your time and your expertise to participate in this event thank you you're welcome happy to pleasure and stay safe everyone and well so remember everybody if your questions were not answered today please check our website for answers and also feel free to continue to submit questions via Ask IDF on our website or attend another virtual event. All right. Well, are we all back here? I'm seeing dozens of people. So we, oh my goodness, guys, we did it. We broke into three uh, uh, different pots. People rotated around and we came back. <laughs> Uh, Sean uh, was in the middle of a sentence and boom, it just knocked him uh, right out. So uh, 
this is a taste of uh, one possibility of what there is to come. So uh, thank you to everyone here for bearing with us and experimenting with us and for participating in this uh, virtual exhibit hall that uh, we have uh, uh, just started with. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed uh, hearing from uh, our sponsors about the many resources uh, that they have to offer our community. We know that five minutes is not enough and uh, there are certainly a lot of other things that you would uh, love to be asking and going deeper. Uh, again, we are going to uh, uh, test and see which, uh, you know, what is the, the secret sauce for making this the best way of engaging. Uh, and again, with the, uh, the, the number of people here, uh, we appreciate your patience and uh, look forward uh, to getting uh, uh, your thoughts afterwards. Uh, so uh, we're almost at the end here of our time together. I uh, appreciate the fact that everyone has uh, stuck with us. Um, the last uh, couple things I'd like to mention uh, is uh, first off, uh, please do remember to take advantage of uh, the various resources that IDF has to offer. Uh, you know, uh, while the uh, the office is now virtual. Um, almost all of our resources are available online. Uh, you can sign up uh, if you have not already uh, to be uh, uh, receive our weekly updates uh, via email and now text. Uh, you can uh, keep track of our upcoming events uh, and then find PDF versions of all of our publications. Um, during this time, we also recognize how important it is to stay connected. This was great. It's lovely to see all of you and to, to talk a little bit. Um, but we do uh, encourage you that uh, uh, to take advantage of some of our uh, various support programs, including our virtual Get Connected groups, um, a new program that we just started this past weekend, uh, where members of our community can connect with each other on uh, Zoom to share their journey and to uh, provide support to each other in uh, small-ish groups. And uh, more information about uh, those programs and some others uh, will be sent out in the email, uh, along with, as I mentioned before, uh, the survey. Uh, so please do fill out that survey uh, and uh, when you get it, uh, just so we know how it is that we did and uh, what you want to see in these events and how we can work together to make our community stronger. Um, so finally, if you have more questions, as you can see from the slide there, uh, you can go online and submit your questions to Ask IDF. Uh, we also have our uh, phone number there, which it takes a little bit to route ar uh, around to the right person. So uh, I always suggest that you uh, use Ask IDF first, if at all possible. Um, it's just a little bit more of an efficient way these days as we feel our way through it. So. Uh, that really brings us to the end of our uh, virtual education event. So uh, thank you once again to our presenters, uh, Dr. Freeman and Dr. Keller, uh, who take, uh, uh, took part of their day out uh, to be with us. Uh, thanks to the IDF Board of Trustees for supporting uh, the staff as we uh, have made this pivot and have uh, given us their full support as we have tried to uh, go into uh, uh, kind of new territory here and uh, made sure that we felt supported along the way uh, to all of our supporters and our sponsors and all else uh, out there who uh, have been communicating with us uh, to make sure that we have the information that we need to provide to you. Um, and then thank you oh so much to all of you for taking the time out of your day to uh, participate in this uh, uh, unique uh, little experiment. Uh, we've really enjoyed uh, spending a part of the afternoon with you um, and, uh, and, and experimenting here and trying things out. And I think that this was a really great start. Um, and we hope that you enjoyed the information that you received here. And just know, um, you know, if on these days when uh, things are a little bit tough, uh, that IDF is here for you, you have a community of uh, people who are in your corner, you're not alone, you are part of our herd. So with that, uh, happy Monday, uh, take care, and uh, do fill out that survey. Thanks, guys. Be well. <laughs>